I once heard the uh, distinguished uh, historian Ted Morgan, who was himself a naturalized American, he was born in France, uh, recount an unlikely encounter that he had with uh, William Faulkner. Uh, Morgan was a very young man. It was November of 1950, um, and Faulkner was returning by way of Paris after receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, somehow, Morgan and his classmates had prevailed on the literary lion to address a student gathering at the Sorbonne. Unfortunately, the Nobel ceremony in Stockholm had been, uh, in Faulkner's well-chosen words, as long as a Mississippi funeral, <laughs> prompting the writer to dose himself liberally with bourbon, his medicine of choice. Consequently, the welcoming committee discovered the great man at his hotel somewhat the worse for wear. After being plied with copious amounts of black coffee, Faulkner was hustled off to the auditorium and a rapturous greeting from his young admirers. At length, the cheers subsided, an air of anticipation filled the room. The speaker did not disappoint. The big difference between Europe and America, said Faulkner, is that we are still adding stars to the flag. He then slumped over, his speech concluded. <laughs> <laughs> but not, I think, before he managed to say something profound about the American Republic and its optimistic inhabitants. For most of us, the United States is indeed a work in progress. Our history resembles nothing so much as an escalator that silently, almost effortlessly, carries each succeeding generation to new heights of prosperity, knowledge, and justice. To most historians, on the other hand, the national experience is less an escalator and more a revolving door. A cyclical round of class conflict marked by alternating periods of heroic aspiration and crass materialism. Think of the progressive era dominated by Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson in contrast to the heedless 1920s. Or FDR's transforming if improvised New Deal versus the prosaic age of Eisenhower. About most of this, a healthy debate rages. Only one chapter, I would submit, in American history inspires near universal derision and a considerable amount of embarrassment. The years from Appomattox to San Juan Hill, roughly bracketed by that soldier turned politician, U.S. Grant, and that politician turned soldier, Teddy Roosevelt. Those years have be become synonymous in both popular and scholarly imagination with parvenu wealth, stifling convention, and officially sanctioned thievery. At once ruthless and sentimental, they stand in scandalous reproach to the high and holy work of abolition and the new birth of freedom proclaimed at Gettysburg. Welcome to what the poet James Russell Lowell dubbed the land of broken promises. As wartime idealism recoiled upon itself, the bitterest reproaches came from the best of men. In a mock catechism written two years before his minor novel, The Gilded Age, inadvertently christened the era, Mark Twain scolded his materialistic countrymen. In Twain's words, quote, what is the chief end of man? To get rich. In what way? Dishonestly if we can, honestly if we must. Who is God, the one and only and true? Money is God, gold and greenbacks and stock, father, son, and the ghost of same. Henry Adams, the son and grandson of American presidents, gave still more savage voice to the betrayal felt by those of his class. According to Adams, it was very easy to disprove conclusively Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, all you had to do was trace the line of presidents from Washington to Grant. <laughs> More recently, some historians and journalists uh, and a few gadflies have found a receptive audience for their gloomy claims that we are inhabiting a new Gilded Age, to which I am tempted to reply, you should be so lucky. Between 1865 and 1900, the rate of American illiteracy was cut in half notwithstanding the enormous explosion in immigration. Expenditures on education during that same period tripled. College enrollment soared by 700 percent. 
Still more impressive was the multiplication of public high schools from 100 in 1860 to 6,000 four decades later. During the same period, 69 land-grant schools, including Michigan, California, Illinois, and Wisconsin, came into existence. The same tycoons stigmatized as crass monopolists poured their fortunes into Chicago, Stanford, Duke, Northwestern, and Vanderbilt. Refuting the conventional view of an era hostile to the working man, the average work week shrank from 70 hours at the outbreak of the Civil War to less than 60 by the end of the century. The struggle for sexual equality paralleled that for economic justice as a booming market developed for typists, stenographers, and telephone operators, almost all of whom were women. Mount Holyoke, Vassar, Wellesley, and Radcliffe opened their doors to female scholars. In 1869, the legislature of Wyoming Territory granted women the same voting rights enjoyed by males, who outnumbered them six to one. A generation later, when the territory's admission to the Union was imperiled by its commitment to female suffrage, the loudest protest came from the men of Wyoming, of whom a sizable contingent telegraphed Washington, quote, we may stay out of the Union a hundred years, but we will come in with our women. As brash, boastful, and ill-mannered as most adolescents, post-Civil War America witnessed an eruption of ideas and energy unmatched in the national story. In the 30 years between 1860 and 1890, 450,000 patents were issued. That was 12 times the total number since the birth of the nation. Everywhere sped up in ways unmistakably like our own frenetic years. A nation without telephones in 1875 counted one and a half million by 1900. The telegraph system, internet of its day, strained to carry a million messages in the year of Appomattox. By 1900, the humming wires accommodated 63 million telegrams a year. During the same period, the number of American newspapers quadrupled. Do modern Americans feel enthralled to the information revolution? Are our lives permanently stuck on fast forward? If so, we are no more frazzled than the generation which annihilated distance in 1866 by stringing the Atlantic cable between Europe and America and listened dumbstruck to Thomas Edison's talking box, what we call the phonograph, while completing a transcontinental railroad to bond a nation still nursing the wounds of fraternal war. But what then of Henry Adams' waspish lament about the parade of Civil War generals who went on to occupy the White House? Writing in the 1930s, Thomas Wolfe, that other Tom Wolfe, dismissed them as the lost Americans, quote, whose gravely vacant, bewhiskered faces mixed melted, swam together. Which had the whiskers, asked Wolf, which the Burnsides, which was which? A group of bearded non-entities is what most of us have been led to believe. They may have worn blue on the battlefield, but in the history books, they appear relentlessly gray. To modern historians, the great crime of most 19th century presidents is their stubborn refusal to behave like most 20th century presidents. 20th century presidents dominate their times. They dictate to Congress. They monopolize the media. They pursue a frenetic activism demanded by a nation of satellite dishes. They approach the Constitution not as a limiting document, but as an enabling one. And that's just for starters. Almost everything about politics in the Gilded Age stands current convention on its head. It was a time when Republicans were radical and Democrats reactionary when liberals flirted with laissez-faire and conservatives rallied under the nationalist banner. It was also a time when people, frankly, uh, defined themselves much more than they do now by their partisan loyalties. Um, it's easy to laugh at the Gilded Age, at mugwumps and scalawags and half-breeds and stalwarts, but the fact is, if you simply look at how many people participated in the political process, they put us to shame. 